what now? Oh, you've already turned me on. Never mind, Jim, I won't say what I was going to say. Um, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning on this last Sunday of Advent, which means it is one week till Christmas. And I am glad that you are here to worship this morning. Not many announcements because we won't have any uh, other activities uh, this week, tonight or on Wednesday night, uh, in the week before leading up to Christmas. But we will have church on Christmas morning. And the time is a little different. We will be meeting at 1030. If you are dressed all casual for your family morning Christmas activities, do not stress out trying to get dressed up to come to church. Come as you are. Come casual and come and worship with us as we celebrate. I should have finished this cough drop before I got up here. Celebrate the birth of Christ by joining us for worship. In your bulletin, you will see one of these. That is not for you to remember. I'm expecting you to remember without this. I want you to take this and invite just one person to church this week with it for next week. There are a lot of people out there who never go to church, but at Christmas want to go to a Christmas service, but they don't know where to go or where they would be welcomed. So take the opportunity this week to invite your friend or a neighbor or just someone you see out and about uh, to come and worship with us next Sunday morning on Christmas. But again, I am glad that you are here. Now, may we joyfully worship together. Last week I mentioned to you that uh, a new movie had come out. I heard the bells that I was planning to see. I did not know how difficult that was going to be, but I wound up having to go to Canton, Georgia to see it. <coughs> it's not playing anywhere else, and there were only three people in the theater, and they were the two people who came with me and me. So it's, <laughs> it's probably not going to be a hugely popular uh, movie, but it does... Uh, sort of give the history and the story behind the writing of I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. But if you're trying to find it, uh, good luck. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but as John mentioned uh, in his remark about uh, joyfully, we are on the Sunday of joy for Advent today. And so let's stand as we sing together our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. <laughs>
just have a week until Christmas. Yeah. I think all the Christmas shopping is done. Yeah. Because yeah, right now the stores are pretty packed. I bet the lines are really long. And I bet there's some pretty stressed out people shopping right now. What do you think? Yep. Yeah. So this time of year, you know, the parking lots are packed, the lines are long, and it can lead to some people not being very happy and nice, right? However, we have to remember the true reason for this season, and that's Jesus, and that Jesus is the joy that, and, and the joy that he brings, and that is what we need to remember. So even when the stores are crazy and the lines are long and things are stressed out and you're going from place to place, always remember that Jesus is the joy and that we should live our life very joyfully. So today, as you are, as we light the Advent wreath and we focus on joy, remember the true meaning for this season. Okay, let's pray. God, as we wait for this day when we celebrate the birth of our Savior and we wait for the day when he will come again, fill our hearts with the joy that only you can bring. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our offertory hymn is hymn number 125. We'll sing uh, the first two stanzas uh, of Angels We Have Heard on High. Please stand as we sing.
Gracious day, what wonderful love, the joy and happiness that comes with Jesus in our hearts. At this time, we are taking this offering in honor of you. May we give the best that we have for our Lord, for the blessings that come to us each day because of your grace. Thank you, Lord. Merry Christmas. Hallelujah. Amen. Please stand for the doxology.
For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Today we relight the candle of expectation and hope. Recalling God's promise to send a Savior, the candle of revelation and love, celebrating the greatness of God's love revealed through the Christ child. And the candle of preparation of, and peace reminding us to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ. As we light the candle of proclamation and joy, may our hearts be forever filled with the joy of his coming. Father, we are filled with joy because we have hope and peace that you have sent your Son for all who believe. Help us to be the voices that proclaim grace and truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. night of long ago has forever changed our world. Heaven and earth colliding in a moment of awestruck wonder. For those once in darkness, a new day has dawned, and a new life had been given. For those worn thin by the concerns of this world, Jesus is the lasting hope of God's eternal plan. For those who grieve in the weariness of their souls, Jesus is the surpassing hope of a faithful God. For those held captive from the rest, Jesus is the abiding peace of a new tomorrow. For any who have wandered from the path of God, Jesus' perfect love calls us home. As we celebrate his birth, we join with the company of old in proclaiming our joy, a joy shared throughout the world, a joy offered for the world. Rejoice, for our Savior has been born. Rejoice, for lives that have been redeemed. Rejoice, for God is with us now and forevermore.
not sure what Jim just said to me, but I think he said he wants to do that four more weeks. <laughs> no, I said it took us four weeks. <laughs> Our scripture for this morning comes from Psalm 96. It's a beautiful psalm, as most of them are. But it is fitting for this joy Sunday of Advent. Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, The Lord is King. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all of the trees of the forest sing for joy. Before the Lord, for He is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth, and he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Joy. Everybody wants it. Everyone needs it. In the advertising department at every company on the planet knows this. Whether expressly or subtly, every product and store you see advertised in some way is trying to convince you that whatever they're offering will bring you joy. Want more joy in your life? Wear our clothes. Want to be filled with joy? Drive our car. Searching for joy? Come to our restaurant and eat. It will be a joyous occasion. Pretty much every ad you see in some way implies that if you make this purchase, it will bring joy. There's even a family dollar billboard right here in Somerville up by Tractor Supply. Big family dollar logo with pictures of random junk on it that says more joy. As if you can go to the family dollar and go down aisle four and buy some joy. Well, I guess you can if that's the dish detergent aisle, but that's a different, different thing. You can't buy real joy. But everybody thinks that they can sell it. And the worst for me, though, I think are the pharmaceutical ads. They, they all have this narrative. We're really sorry you have this terrible illness, but take our medicine and you will feel better. You will be filled with joy unless, of course, you experience this litany of side effects or die. Otherwise, you will not be joyful. It drives me crazy. But you get the picture doesn't matter what you're selling, doesn't matter what your business is, everybody knows that joy is something that people crave, something that people want. But joy doesn't come from things, it doesn't come from stuff, it doesn't even come from other people. When we think about joy, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, does whatever talk the talk or does it actually walk the walk? Can that really 
make me joyful? And the answer is always no. Because real, authentic, shout to the heavens joy really only has one source. And that's God. God both desires that we experience joy and He is the source of joy. That's a joy that isn't fleeting. That's a joy that lasts beyond the moment. That is a joy that lasts because it's deep down in our soul. As a kid in church, I remember singing this song. It went... I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Where? I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. I'm glad to see I'm not the only one that learned that song growing up. But that's the kind of joy that God provides for us. That's the kind of joy that God promises. It isn't shallow. It doesn't come with side effects or crushing debt. You can't find it on an aisle in the store. But it's a joy that is so firmly rooted in our heart that there's nothing that can take it away. That is the kind of joy that's worth shouting for. Psalm 96 that I just read celebrates God as the source of this joy. And in its original context, Psalm 96 was written during a time of great upheaval in the lives of the Hebrew people. They were no stranger to tough times, but in particular, most scholars believe that uh, Psalm 96 was likely written during an invasion, one of the many. And in a time when the Hebrew people were dealing with tyrants, dealing with being enslaved, dealing with being kicked out of their country, living in a time when their world, as they knew it, was absolutely being destroyed. It was written among a generation of people who had only ever known chaos and corruption, pain and suffering. Doesn't sound like joyful occasion, does it? But yet the psalm proclaims That in God, there is joy to be found. That in the the kingdom of God, no matter what one's circumstances are, there is joy to be found. And as you heard sung beautifully this morning, in this season, as we anticipate Christmas, we anticipate joy coming to the world. We anticipate the baby in the manger. We anticipate Jesus Christ coming into the world, the advent of the Christ, the advent of God made flesh coming into the world so that we can experience that joy. Christ born is the one whom the psalm looks forward to, the one who will make the world right, the one who can bring joy into a broken world. That is what Jesus does. Jesus brings all the people, all the joy. It is Jesus for whom heaven and nature sing. Jesus promises us a joy that nothing can ever rob us of. And when we make Jesus the source of our joy, Nothing can take Jesus away from us. We can live in an imperfect world with joy because our Messiah is perfect. Jesus is God taking on human flesh, coming into our world to pave the way for joy. This is why we celebrate. This is the reason for the season. This is why we should shout for joy. But, and you know nothing good ever comes after this. The thing is, 
Sometimes, no matter how much we tell ourselves that, no matter how much we say we believe it and want to believe it, we still find ourselves unable to shout for joy. We might even be hard-pressed to whisper for joy. Why does that happen? Because sometimes we lose sight of this continuous joy that God promises us. And we instead look for what I call conditional joy. We in our thoughts tie our joy to our condition, our circumstances. We tell ourselves, I'll be joyful when this happens. Or I get this or that changes, or this part of my life gets fixed, then and only then can I be joyful. We fall for the lie that joy can only be found when the conditions are just right. And in so doing, we rob ourselves of one of God's great promises. That joy is continual, that it's always there, that it's always available, that it's something that surpasses the pain and brokenness of this world, that no matter what, we still have a reason to shout for joy. Conditional joy turns us into victims of circumstance. Continuous joy turns us into overcomers. When we can praise the Lord and sing and shout for joy on, even on the darkest of days, even in the worst moments of our lives, we can still see a light at the end of the tunnel. But when we tie our joy to people or things or events, more often than not, it's going to leave us in the dark, not knowing which way to go. When our joy is grounded in Christ, nothing can rob us of that joy. In the Gospel of John, Chapter 16, verse 22, Jesus himself says this. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. So when our joy is rooted in Christ, can the circumstances of our life take it away from us? No. Can sin take away our joy? No. Christ is bigger than our sin. Can being abandoned or hurt or mistreated by someone steal our joy? No, because Christ will never abandon us or leave us disappointed. Can your own personal failures rob you of joy? No, because God's plans are bigger than our plans. Sickness and death cannot even take our joy because Jesus conquered that too. Nothing is greater than Jesus. And Jesus is the source of joy. And when we proclaim joy to the world, the Lord has come. We are proclaiming something that is bigger and better than anything else has arrived in our lives. Something that truly empowers us and overcomes all obstacles. In John 16, 33, Jesus tells us this. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. He doesn't say you might have trouble. Jesus doesn't say, life maybe will get a little hard for you. He says, you will have trouble. 
But here's a good but, rare occasion. But be of good cheer. In spite of the troubles that will come, despite the problems you will have, despite whatever struggles you endure, be of good cheer because I've got you. That's what Jesus says to us. And to be of good cheer is to be filled with joy. Joy was one of the trademark behaviors of the earliest Christians in the New Testament letters and in Acts and even in historical documents and records about the early church. Over and over again, you hear about how joyful they were, how they stood out in a broken world because they were filled with joy. They praised God, they lived with joyful hearts, when in all honesty, based on their life, they didn't have much of a reason to. They were persecuted, they were poor, they were forced into poverty. They never knew what was going to happen, if they would get arrested, if they would be executed. They didn't know what would happen. But yet they were joyful. They stood out because of that. And it's a shame to say, but I don't know that the church in 2022 or for a long time really stands out in that way. I don't know if you ask someone to describe the signature trademark of Christians if joy would be the first thing that would come to their mind. We've got all the comforts in the world. But we struggle to find joy just like everybody else. And that includes me. You know, sometimes I think life being easier than it was in the ancient world is part of the reason for that. It's too easy to be self-reliant. too easy to give in to societal pressures. It's too easy to make excuses. It's too easy to get distracted. And all those things keep us from fully trusting God the way that Jesus calls us to. And all too often we're unable to shout for joy because of that. Because we've allowed ourselves to focus on conditional joy without coming back to the source of our continual joy. But you know what? Jesus can help us with that. Advent can help us with that. Christmas can help us with that. I read recently in some materials I've, I've been reading, working through some things on my personal journey, that the first step in changing your life is changing your thoughts. And to me, that was a, a profound phrase. So I challenge you this morning. Look at your thoughts. Use them to assess your joy level. Are your thoughts joyful or joyless? Are you filled with positivity or negativity? Are you the Grinch before or after his heart grew three sizes? If your answers 
like mine, unfortunately, did reveal a lack of joy? Start with changing your thoughts. Turn them to Christ. Know that joy is possible. Don't let despair and hurt rob you of joy. Don't let what you've been through rob you of joy. Don't let society reminding you of what you do or don't have rob you of joy. Don't let anything take away from you what God has always intended for you to have. My morning devotion one day this week was on 1 Peter 5. And this, this verse really, these verses really stuck out to me. All of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that He may exalt you in time. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist Him. Steadfast in your faith. For you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And even though you suffer for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen and establish you. When we try to find joy in ourselves, we fail. That's prideful. When we try to find joy in this world, whether it be in stuff, our career, or even relationships, we fail. It makes us anxious. It opens the door for the devil to creep into our lives and rob us of everything that is good. And he either convinces us that there's no joy to be found or that it can be found in things that aren't healthy or helpful for us. Instead, we must humble ourselves and realize it's not about us, but realize that joy is available freely, given to us from heaven and a baby, in a manger. Joy isn't about us. It's about Christ. And when we put Christ front and center, that joy that is so elusive becomes ever-present. Not just at this time of the year when we sing joy to the world, but something we can believe in and embody every day of the year. So this morning, join me in asking Lord, what is keeping me from shouting with joy? Ask God to replace whatever conditional joys you may have with his continual joy. Trust Christ for the joy that nothing can ever take away from you. And he will give it. For Christ comes to us in the manger. And heaven and nature sing. Let us too sing and shout for joy. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Please stand for our hymn of response.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we continue this Advent season by lighting the candles of proclamation and joy. With this act, Lord, we recognize the celebration of the ultimate arrival here on earth of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we sang this morning of the joy of our anticipation of his birth in the manger, we shall forever praise you for this wondrous event. Now, Father, with joy still in our hearts, we ask that you lead us homeward with the glorious knowledge of just how much this season means to us. We will forever rejoice for Mary and the baby she bore as your eternal gift on this holiday. In your name, God, we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 